Yeah, be, um, it looks like it's already recording. Do I, will I just press pause right now? Yes, I'm sorry. I just realized okay. I was on mute. Okay. Um, go ahead and um, you could pause it or you could stop it and then restart it when you're ready to go. Okay, I think I'll yeah. just pause it for now. And yeah, we'll get started with um, our training today. So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today to our training and happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, today in this training, we'll be going over three main topics, invoicing, digital signature, and FAST, formerly known as the Financial Assistance Application Submittal Tool. And just a reminder, since we're on Zoom, please make sure to rename yourself um, as seen in, in this slide, first last name and your organization name. And then for there'll be two methods to ask questions during this presentation. So during the presentation, you can add questions in the chat. And also there will be several Q&A periods throughout the presentation where you can raise your hand and ask your questions verbally to the presenters. And so this is today's training agenda. Um, we'll be going over the digital signatures on work plans and invoicing, and the presenter presenting on these two items is Jason Hennington. He is a water resource control engineer in the Small Community Technical Assistant Unit 1. And presenting on FAST is Ibying Rivera, a sanitary engineering associate also in the Small Community Technical Assistance Unit 1. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jason Heddington. Uh, thank you, Michaela, for the introduction. And first, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone for coming out today and attending this training. I know that with competition like uh, St. Patrick's Day festivities and the March Madness tournament, I'm just happy to be here sharing some uh, some important information about invoicing digital signatures with the group. So um, before we get started, I wanted to go through some of the common acronyms that are going to be used throughout um, the presentation. So first, uh, if you've been with us for a long time, a lot of these might be familiar to you, but to create a baseline, uh, I've included um, a lot of simple ones as well, such as TA standing for technical assistance and TAP standing for technical assistance provider. We're going to be covering um, mainly the, the PD or project director position uh, within the technical assistance provider. So um, this is the person who is identified on their agreement, who can sign, um, who can sign invoicing documents as well as um, deviation forms and time requests for their agreement itself. So um, you, uh, you should all know who your designated project director is, but this acronym is going to come up throughout the, the invoicing slides. And then from, from our end, the Division of Financial Assistance, we're going to be referencing two uh, main roles, the project manager and the disbursement analyst. And so the project manager um, is the one who's kind of working with the technical assistance provider and helping manage the agreement and the work plans that are part of the technical assistance agreements. And the disbursement analyst is one of the reviewers of the invoice once that's been submitted. And uh, we'll go through more specifically what the project manager and disbursement analyst role in the invoice process is later during this presentation. However, first, I wanted to start with uh, covering the Adobe sign process that was recently implemented um, under technical assistance. And so going forward, um, DFA is going to be using Adobe sign to route work plans for electronic signature. And the link to Adobe sign is right here. And um, after the presentation, um, these slides will be available in PDF form, so you'll be able to access this link. Um, however, this will take you to the Adobe Sign website, where you can log in using an Adobe account and have access to the um, Adobe Sign agreements. And so um, to use the Adobe Sign agreement, um, your technical assistance agreement, or to use Adobe Sign the website, your technical assistance agreement must first be updated to contain language authorizing the use of electronic signatures. And so I've pulled an example from one of our agreements, but it'll look something similar to this. There'll be a signature block here, and it will 
contain language which in more words says that um, both the recipient and the state water boards agree that using this electronic signature is um, the same as a physical signature for the purposes of validity, enforceability, and admissibility of, um, of the documents. So, so if you already have this language added to your agreement, you're, um, you can start using the Adobe Sign process. If not, work with your technical assistance project manager um, to, to inquire about the status of adding this to your agreement. And so uh, here are the Adobe Stein set, Adobe Sign steps. So once the work plan has been approved by DFA, then the TA project manager is going to initiate the execution process using Adobe Sign. And so they'll, they'll set that up on the Adobe Sign website. And then the default routing is for the document to be sent to the TA provider project director, then to the DFA signer. And then once that's been completed, the document will be redispersed to both signers and everyone included on the CC list for that process. And so um, signatures will be requested by Adobe um, through this process and reminder emails will be sent automatically through the process. Um, and then once the TA project director approves, Adobe will um, automatically send the signature to DFA. And like I said, um, a multiple co or a copy will be sent to all of the people included on the CC list. And one thing I wanted to emphasize is that this is the default routing process. And so each TA provider might have uh, unique um, execution processes in place. And we want to work with you to match up the Adobe sign process with what um, steps you already have um, ongoing to make that as smooth of a transition as possible. So for example, um, I know that you can add an approver step into this routing process where it's not an additional signer, but you can have an email designated to review the, the work plan document and approve before it's sent to the um, TA provider project director. And um, you can also adjust the frequency at which Adobe sends these reminder emails. So the point being, there's a lot of different settings that we are yet to explore in Adobe Sign. And so um, we encourage you to work with your TA project manager to talk about um, ideas for how to improve the Adobe Sign process or make it better fit to your organization. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover with Adobe Sign is that there's a way that you can update, upload your signature to your profile. The benefit of doing this is that you would be able to access and sign documents from any, um, any device that could access your Adobe account and your email. So the first step is you want to log into Adobe Sign using the link that I um, provided earlier. And then this image right here should be a representation of the homepage. And what you're looking for is on the right-hand side here, there's a, I put a red box around it, but there should be your name. And then um, there's this My Profile option under the dropdown. And you're gonna click on that. And then that's gonna open up this menu here. And so then you're gonna click personal preferences, which has another dropdown. And then under that dropdown is my signature. And so this is where you can upload your signature and have it saved to your Adobe account. And so once you get here, you're gonna click create, and that's gonna open this box where it says draw image or mobile. And to create your signature, you're going to select image, and then you're gonna upload a image of your handwritten signature to Adobe. And once you've done that, you'll it'll look like this bottom image here where um, you have the option to edit the, the, the signature still, but it'll have a, an image of your handwritten signature here. And again, this is important because on the work plans, we want a signature that represents in your handwritten signature. We don't want the we don't want anything that looks like typed or is a is a font signature. We want to we want it to be a representation of your actual signature. And so this process right here will ensure that it, it looks like this. And then the second benefit is that once the signature is uploaded to your Adobe account, you can click the link in the email to open up the document, and then you can just click the box and it will automatically add your signature without any other steps required. All right, are there any questions um, from the audience about the, the new Adobe sign process? All right, I'm seeing none. So I know that 
um, part of the Adobe Sign process is going to be to trial it first, and then you might have um, organization-specific questions for your project manager. So definitely, I encourage you to uh, reach out and work with them as you've given this a try once or twice to see what modifications to this process are needed to, to get the, the execution running smoothly for your organization. The next here, um, we're going to move on to invoices. And so the first step when talking about invoices is to go over the portion of the technical assistance agreement that covers invoicing, because that's going to outline a lot of the, um, the provisions for your um, specific agreement and when you can and can't invoice. So the information about invoices can be found in Exhibit B funding provisions in our standard DFA uh, agreement template. And um, the provisions included in Exhibit B um, include some of the following. So it'll outline eligible project costs, um, and it states that these costs must be reimbursed through disbursement requests. And we'll go over what a disbursement request looks like in the forms needed later in the presentation. Second, it'll say that invoices must be submitted no less than quarterly and no more than monthly. So a fancy way of saying you can invoice between one and three month intervals. So typically we see a one month interval or a three month interval. Third, it says that invoices can only include work that has been completed, which was performed after the agreement start date and contained within the agreement scope of work. So important um, to summarize this point is that the work that we reimburse um, must already be completed. So we can't pay for work that has yet to be done. And then finally, the agreement will outline the final invoice request date and the final invoice must be clearly marked and submitted prior to this date. And so on the title page, there's a few important dates that the agreement highlights. And so one of them is the work completion date. And then typically right under that's the final disbursement request date. And so just make sure that the final invoice for the agreement is submitted prior to this private this date. The second thing contained in the agreement is um, the indirect costs. And so indirect costs aren't going to be covered in uh, much more detail throughout the rest of the presentation. But I wanted to highlight here, kind of define indirect costs and what are some examples of eligible indirect and ineligible indirect. So indirect costs, um, these are reimbursements for actual, not budgeted costs that are associated with the implementation and management of the project. And so some examples might be um, rent, utilities, office equipment, office supplies, postage, telephone um, lines, or staff training development. These are items that are eligible indirect costs and they're required for uh, managing and implementing the projects. They could be included in the indirect cost line item of your agreement. Some examples of ineligible indirect costs might be uh, copyrights, taxes, licenses, fines, penalties, fees, insurance deductibles, advertising, tuition and scholarship, travel and meal costs not covered by CalHR, conference attendance and subscriptions or publication fees. And so these aren't exhaustive lists. These are some examples. Um, so if you have a question about a specific cost and whether or not that it's eligible, then the first place to check would be in the agreement language. And then if you want to confirm, then reach out to your TA project, project manager and work through it with them. And so um, the third part of the agreement that's important is the one of the forms that you fill out to accompany the agreement, which is called the project director certification form. And it pertains to invoicing because it has this box right here that lists designee's name, designee email, and designee signature. And so um, any staff member that is designated in the project director certification form will be able to submit invoice documents and sign the invoice documents that we talk about later in the presentation. So I'm gonna skip forward to this summary here, who can sign what. So on some of our technical assistance agreements, this authorized representative and project director, um, they can be occupied by the same person. So for the purposes of this presentation, we have the project director who's gonna be the one signing the agreement related documents, these first two, and then they can also sign the invoice related documents, which are these next three. However, if you want to designate a employee that can um, sign invoice documents and submit those to DFA, then it needs to be done in the project director certification form and that authorizes them to, to fill out and sign these forms right here and also to submit invoices through email. And so 
I wanted to start with an overview of the invoice review process and some of the target timelines. And so important to note that the target review time is 45 days from invoice submission to the payment of the invoice. However, the, um, the project manager and disbursement analyst review timelines are going to vary depending on the length of the invoice and the number of projects or number of ARs that are uh, being invoiced. Um, so this 45 days is uh, DFA's target, um, but it will it can vary depending on the, um, the length of the invoice and, like I said, number of projects. So the first step is as the TA provider, the invoice is going to be submitted. And we'll go over some of the proper methods of submission. But then once it's submitted to DFA, the, it'll be given to the disbursement analyst who's going to review the invoice. Um, and then these targets, the 10 days and the 14 days are from the, um, the TA uh, metrics that we sent out recently. Um, so the disbursement analyst is going to review the invoice at once they finish their review, they're going to send it to the DFA project manager, who is also going to provide a review for the invoice and check all of the items that were flagged by the dispersed panelists. Um, this review might result in a dispute, um, a dispute being a point where the, the DFA PM will email the TA provider with a, with a list of items that either need clarification, additional justification, or if there's a reason to um, deduct an amount from the invoice, and such as an ineligible item. Um, if needed, the dispute's going to pause the 45-day target clock, so to speak, until the dispute is resolved. So if there's no dispute or once the dispute's resolved, the DFA PM is going to approve the invoice and send it back to the disbursement analyst. Disbursement analysts will then approve payment of the invoice. They're going to notify the TA provider and submit the invoice to accounting. And so as the TA provider, this is probably the step where you receive an email from the disbursement analyst saying that the invoice has been approved and that payment will be um, will be on its way. And from this point, what happens is the invoice goes to our accounting, who also approves the payment. And then accounting, uh, once payment's approved, releases the invoice to the state's controller's office, who will then send out the, the check. And so this process takes, on average, four to six weeks. So going back to the first step, the invoice submission, there's two methods for submitting invoices. Um, the first is emailing the invoice submission to the DFA PM, um, along with uploading the invoice to FAST simultaneously. And if you're doing this method, then what happens is you'll send the invoice to the PM, and then the PM will forward the invoice to the disbursement inbox, CCing the disbursement analyst. Um, and then the second method is emailing directly to the DFA disbursements inbox, along with a simultaneous FAST submission. And so if you're doing this method, the as a TA provider, you would just send the invoice directly to this email address right here, DFA disbursements at waterboards.ca.gov. And you would CC the PM and the DA on that submission, just so that everyone's in the loop and knows that the, the timeline for the invoice review has begun. And so um, you might notice that these are very similar to each other, with the only real difference being where the um, where the invoice is submitted via email. But for both, it's important to note that the email submission must be sent from either the project director or an authorized email account on the PD certification form, which is what we covered earlier. So if, uh, if you want to designate a staff to be able to submit invoices on behalf of the program, then you can work with your TA project manager to add them to that designees list under the project director certification form. And here we have the required documents um, that should be contained within an invoice submission. And so the first one is the disbursement request form or the DIS form. And we'll have some examples of uh, what a correct, correctly filled out forms look like in, in a few slides. Um, second, we have the reimbursement request form or form 261. This one we also call the RR form. So there's, there's three different names for it. Um, this one needs to be separate from the invoice package um, as a whole. So form number one and form number three can be in the same PDF, but form number two, the reimbursement request needs to be its own separate PDF form for reasons that I'll cover later in the presentation. The, the third item is the invoice package itself. 
And so this is going to contain um, some forms related directly to the invoice, such as the invoice submittal checklist, the labor certification form, and then all supporting documents needed to back up the information that's put onto forms one, two, and then three A and three B. And the fourth required item is a copy of the progress report. I've included an asterisk here because the progress report doesn't need to be contained in your email submission spe specifically, but it should be uploaded to FAST and approved by a DFA project manager um, before the invoice review process starts. So what you can do is if, if your progress report's already been reviewed and approved, you can make sure that the box in the invoice submittal checklist is checked for the progress report. This lets everyone know who's reviewing that that item has been taken care of. Um, so, so just to summarize, you, you can include the progress report in your invoice submission if you want to. Um, however, if you're doing it separately, both of these items should be uploaded to FAST. Just make sure that your progress report has been approved and uploaded to FAST prior to invoice submission. And so here's an example of form number one, the disbursement request form. Um, once you've executed your agreement with DFA, the disbursement analyst will send out um, some template forms for you to keep, and that will help you with your invoice invoicing. So this will be included as one of those template forms. And all of the white space on the form will, um, will either be automatically updated or you won't need to fill that in. Um, you just need to fill in the yellow spaces. So you can see here on the form that there's some numbers. So it's numbered one through 10. Um, contained on page two of this document are some helpful instructions for each of these specifically to help you fill that out. But um, to, to summarize what you need to do is just fill in the yellow spaces and follow the yellow brick road. So the screen box here, these spaces, these spaces, and these spaces, make sure that you fill out the information uh, related to this invoice, the, the invoice that you're um, completing, and then make sure that the project director signs here and dates. Um, unless your TA agreement contains match funds, then you can safely ignore this box eight here. Um, it's not required to be filled out. And so elaborating on the signature here from the project director, um, this um, image that I pulled is from the, the instructions that are sent out along with uh, the invoice templates. And so you can see from here that signatures one through four are acceptable on the DIS form. So that's this uh, Adobe digital signature here with the digital date stamp or any of these three signatures that um, resemble a handwritten image of a, an image of a handwritten signature. What we don't want is this type on the right that is a typed signature with like that font, like signature font. We don't want that. Any of these other four can be used on the, on the DIS form. And second, we have an example of the reimbursement request form. And so on this one, you only need to fill out the following three sec sections. This area in the middle right here, where you input the amount requested, and these two zones at the bottom where you input the signature and the date. Um, and the important part here is you can see that there's these blue sections at the top right, and then there's some more blue sections um, below that's kind of cut off by the image. But these you don't need to fill out because the disbursement analyst is going to complete this form once they receive it. So um, just to repeat, you only need to fill out these um, sections that are boxed in green. And then the second point for the reimbursement request form is that, like I said earlier, this needs to be a separate document from the from the package submission. And that's because if you include it in the package, these uh, these fillable forms, these light blue ones, will be destroyed, and uh, we the disbursement analyst won't be able to fill out the remainder of the form. So make sure that you submit this as a separate PDF to keep all of these fields intact. Then similarly, here's the instructions um, for acceptable signatures on the um, RR form. Important to note here um, is that signature A is the only signature type that will keep the formulas intact. So if you're submitting digitally, please just use signature type A so that none of the fields contained on the form are destroyed. All right, moving on to the package itself. Um, the first document that you need to include in the package is the invoice submittal checklist. This one is more for the TA provider's benefit. It has a list of um, required documents on the, 
On the invoice, some of these that we've already gone over, such as the RR form, the DIS form, and these top two right here. But um, as the provider, you're just going to check the box yes if you've included all these items, and then you're going to include a signature and a date at the bottom. Uh, the signature type for this one can match the same requirements as the DIS form. And then the second document included in the invoice package is the labor certification form. And so this document is important for summarizing all of the personnel hours contained within the invoice and putting all of that information onto one page. So you can see that we need employee name and employee classification. So for your admin time and for all the time spent on work plans, you're gonna list um, employees that, are, um, that were involved in that work. Then you're gonna list the classification and then some of the other information here on the right, and then um, the total will be filled out automatically. The important part of this form is that this amount right here, the total personnel cost, this needs to match whatever is reported in the DIS. So the DIS has a spot for personnel costs on the invoice, make sure that whatever that number is matches up with whatever numbers reported here and that the rest of your supporting documentation supports getting to this number. Similarly, the signature type for this document can, can match the DIS requirements as well. And then finally, we have um, some examples of the supporting documents that um, might be required on your invoice. And so the first being the progress report. And as we discussed before, you can include a copy of your progress report with your submission, or um, you can have just an approved copy uploaded to FAST. Either way, the, the project manager is gonna use the progress report when they're reviewing the invoice. And so it's going to be, um, it's going to be supplemental to the invoice review and it is uh, required. So wherever you want to include a copy of that, either an email submission or a previous submission to FAST is good. Second, you're going to have one or perhaps multiple, depending on your agreement, PM and admin details forms. And so this is for any work done to support the agreement itself, not necessarily specific to a one work plan or one AR. And then third, you're going to have work plan invoice detail forms. And so for each AR, you're going to fill out one of these forms and it'll detail the amount of personnel hours spent on the work plan as well as any um, of the other agreement categories, such as travel or consultant costs for that work plan. Um, and then fourth, um, you're gonna include the labor certification form and you're gonna include any backup documentation you might need to support the numbers included on there. Um, five, any travel costs associated with the project, make sure you include receipts. Um, six, again, re receipts for supplies and equipment for any um, of those costs being claimed. And then item seven is invoices for professional or consultant services, including laboratory services. So to summarize, I'm gonna back up here. On your supporting documentation, you're going to have one invoice submittal checklist, one labor certification form, summarizing all the labor done on the invoice. And then you're going to have um, a different mix of these items here, depending on what's being claimed. Um, you, most likely you'll have one admin sheet for the admin work done and then you'll have work plan invoice detail forms for each ar and there's some exceptions to this such as if your agreement has multiple um, administrative like categories or if you are participating in capacity development work you might be tracking the specifics of um, item three differently or item two but that's kind of a on average, you'll have one of these and then multiple of these form of these uh, item three. All right, and so um, I just have really quickly some examples of the PM and admin form and the work plan details form. And so these are very similar. Um, you'll note that there's a there's a spot for personnel and then all of the other agreement categories here. This first form is just for the admin work done to support the agreement. And the second one is for um, most commonly each AR is going to have one of these in the invoice. So you can see at the top here, it says TA start date, TA recipients, uh, work plan ID number. So you'd, you'd fill out this and that would indicate to the person reviewing which project this is for. And then you can include personnel consultant costs for that work plan on here.
Next, I wanted to cover some of the CalHR guidelines. Um, the CalHR guidelines for travel are quite extensive, and I recommend for, um, going to their website, which I've linked here, to fully review some of the conditions and criteria for their travel. However, there's, there's three big categories of travel. There's the meals, there's the overnight lodging, and then there's the personal vehicle mileage rate. And so these three tables are something that it's a good idea to check every time you're doing an invoice just to make sure that the, the rates have not changed, that you're using the correct rates. And so you can see the rates for meals up here. Um, please reference the CalHR website to determine um, the length of travel and how that corresponds to what meals can be claimed. Um, there's, there's separate rules for travel less than 24 hours versus travel that goes longer than 24 hours. And those are um, explained in, in better detail on their website. Um, however, these are the, the rates for meals that can be claimed. Second, we have the maximum lodging reimbursement rates. Um, all counties except the ones that are listed in the table have a maximum rate of 90. And then these counties, um, the maximum rate increases per night. And so, again, um, if you're looking for information about a specific county, or if you're wondering how um, taxes for the room are affected and contribute into this number, then um, that information can be found on CalHR's website. And then finally, um, the, the current vehicle mileage reimbursement rate is listed on the website in this table here. And so um, for 2023, that number is 65 and a half cents per mile, as you can see in the first row. And so when you're preparing the travel supporting documentation, you're going to want to include these four items that I've listed here. So the first being the starting and the ending address of the travel. The second being the total miles traveled. The third um, being a map showing the route taken. And I put an asterisk here because um, if you're receiving backup documentation from a subcontractor, um, we're not requiring them to include a map of their travel specifically. However, know that um, we still need to have information about the travel to, con to verify it, um, DFA does, and the DFA project manager might request justification to support their review of the travel. And so, however, for the TA providers, um, we're asking for a map showing the route taken on the travel. And then item four is that justification that I mentioned. So any additional information that helps explain what route was taken, how many miles were traveled, if there were tolls, um, for example, would be helpful. Anything helpful to supporting the, um, the, support, the, the documentation should be included in a written note. Then other types of travel, um, such as rental cars and flights, might require additional items to these four, such as receipts or cost comparisons, depending on what method of travel is used. And so I've included an example of um, backup documentation that we might want to see on an invoice for travel. And I'm going to highlight the, the four items that I just went over. So the first item is we want to see the start and end address. And you can see that that's listed up top here. The travel started at Golden Gate Park, and they traveled to DFA's headquarter buildings in Sacramento. Second, we have the total number of miles driven, and so that's 85.9. And from the justification, we know that this was a, a round trip. So, But the we have the total um, mileage from point A to point B listed here on the backup. Item three is the map. And so by right-clicking on Google Maps and clicking Print, you can get um, a very good map of the travel conducted and include that in the invoice package. And then also on Google Maps, if you use this method, you can include item four justification quite easily because there's a section to type out notes. So you can see that this person, um, they explain that and confirm that this is a round trip, total of 179 miles. They confirm the start time and the end time of their travel which might be helpful for determining meals eligibility um, under CalHR. Um, they've noted that they drove six miles on site, which is helpful if their claim is, ends up being higher than this 179. Um, for example, if it's 185 miles, then we know that the extra mileage being claimed was um, from what they drove on site. And then they have also noted that they included, or that they will be reimbursing for tolls. And so then we know that we're looking for receipts for the, for the tolls. And so um, in, in this image, this is um, like, if this was a page after the consultant, um, 
backup documentation showing the travel, this would this would answer all of um, most of our questions. And so that concludes the types of forms and the types of backup documentation that we'd be looking for in an invoice. And so that's what gets submitted to DFA disbursements. Once DFA disbursements receives the invoice package, um, they're going to begin their review and they're going to utilize these categories here. And so first they're going to check the invoice forms. Uh, they're going to check if the forms are complete, correct, and if they're referencing the correct time frame, um, make sure all the items are in the billing period. Um, they're also going to check the invoice submittal checklist, make sure that all of the required items are included and will be checked off by the TA provider. Then the bulk of the review is going to be focused on this work plan, invoice details, and supporting documentation. And they're going to review items such as making sure that the rates in the labor certification form are eligible based off of uh, the agreement budget. Um, asterisks here because uh, the budget that's submitted with your technical assistance agreement has classification information. And so we treat that as the maximum for that classification. So when we when we're checking individuals on the labor certification, we just need to ensure that their rate doesn't exceed the, the rate set for that classification in your budget. And so um, that's what the disbursement analysts and the PM are going to be looking for in this item. And then in general, the, the PM will check if project costs are eligible. Um, the PM working more directly with the, with the work plan will have a better idea. And so the DA often will flag items that, um, that are questionable, and then the PM will make the final review. Third, the PM is going to check the all the travel and make sure that those meet the CalHR guidelines. And then they're going to check the supporting documentation, such as uh, consultant invoices, make sure that those are within the correct billing period. And then finally, as they go through the review, the disbursement analyst is going to be looking at the calculations and uh, making sure that there's no typos or errors that they can um, in those documents. And then once the DA completes their review, the DFA project manager will begin their review and approval. And so some of the items for the backup documentation are going to overlap. For example, the, the project manager is going to be checking for eligible costs as well, and we'll be checking all the items flagged by the disbursement analyst. And they're going to be checking for making sure costs are directly related to project work, and they're also going to be checking the, the rates and travel. However, um, the project manager is also going to cross-reference the progress report with the invoice and make sure that all of the work being reported in the progress report is matching up with the work being invoiced in the invoice and make sure that if there's any delays or issues that are noted in the progress report, that, um, that we're not paying out for delayed work in the invoice too early, for example. They're just going to make sure that um, the reports match up with what's being requested in the invoices. And then, of course, um, they're going to check calculations as they go, also looking for typos and, um, and other calculation errors. And so I've, I've mentioned a lot of uh, eligible versus ineligible costs. And so I've compiled a list that should look pretty similar to the um, indirect costs from earlier, but with a few key differences. Um, however, note that there's a difference between agreements based off of salary and fringe versus agreements that are based off of the standard hourly rate. And so I'll actually cover that first. If we look at Item number two here, if you're using the standard, uh, if you're using the salary and fringe um, reimbursement method, then consultants can't charge indirect costs, overhead, or markup fees. And I know that recently we've been developing agreements with um, consultant TA providers. And so um, those TA providers are using a standard hourly rate for reimbursement and have different requirements for this. So um, asterisks on the indirect costs being ineligible um, it base, it's based off of the, the method of your reimbursement. And then second, um, we have overtime hours charged at a higher rate. Another asterisk here because um, we, we might need to pay out overtime at a higher rate if that work is, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the term, but um, Basically, if it's a prevailing wage, if the overtime hours are paid at prevailing wage, then we might need to pay them out. But this asterisk is here 
because um, overtime hours need to be approved by DFA prior to being uh, conducted. And then whether or not the overtime hours are eligible is a more of a case by case analysis. So if you know that you're gonna need overtime on a project, make sure to work with your TA project manager first and um, confirm that the overtime being conducted, the reasoning behind that, send that to the project manager, and then they will work out with you um, whether or not the overtime hour rate can be used. But so that's why there's an asterisk here, but for the, in general, overtime hours should not be charged and it should be charged the normal rate. Um, and then the rest of these items, um, we have equipment not specifically needed for the project, tuition fees, deductibles for insurance, audit costs, travel and meals outside of CalHR, and then some of the similar items to the indirect costs um, seen earlier. I will highlight here though that um, legal fees associated with litigation are not are ineligible costs. And so here are some common invoice errors that are found during the review. And so the first being if incorrect or missing signatures and dates um, on the invoice. So if the if if there's any incorrect or missing signatures, then that um, needs to be corrected before the invoice can be approved. Um, oftentimes that's a dispute item. Second, if there's items outside of the billing period, they need to be accompanied with justification explaining why the items being um, charged outside of the billing area, um, billing period. Like I said previously, we can't reimburse for work that is yet to be completed, but if you have work from a past invoice period without any justification on it, then that's not going to be eligible and you need to work with the TA project manager to provide justification for why those items are being charged outside of the billing period. Third, we have uh, incorrect invoice submission methodology. You're gonna want to stick to one of the two methods we highlighted earlier in the presentation. And then fourth, calculation errors, which happens to everyone, but any work you can do to kind of catch those and get on top of it will definitely smooth out the review process. Fifth, um, any deviation from CalHR travel guidelines. This can cause problems during the review. So this might include um, the consultant rounding up on the number of miles they're claiming or um, rounding down even. Um, and any other deviations such as not using the correct mileage rate, they sometimes use a previous year's mileage rate, which reduces the total claim. So a good thing to check when they're claiming travel is just to make sure that the correct CalHR guidelines for the when the travel was conducted are being used. Six, uh, missing or incorrect consultant backup documentation. So we need to um, we need to have a invoice included even for subcontractors, even if the subcontractor is doing work at like a um, at like a flat fee. So um, oftentimes, and speaking for the the salary and fringe agreements, um, we we need to uh, see the hours and the um, the rates for the subcontractors as well working on items. However, um, we need to see those as well as um, an invoice in general, even if they're doing work that would be reimbursed at a at a standard rate. So um, this item, just make sure that the consultant can um, submits proper backup documentation. And then lastly, we have unclear annotations. So through the process of copying the invoice documents and putting them into the PDF and submitting, there might be like at one time colored pen markings that now look the black, just like the other characters, or there might be um, notes that were once there that maybe got cut off. And so sometimes it's um, difficult to read or understand notes on the PDF document. So a really helpful um, tip for submitting the PDFs is to include a comment on the PDF document, explaining the purpose of a note. And that's going to, speed up the review process greatly for the um, DA and for the PM. And so once the PM approves the invoice, um, they will submit the whole package to the disbursements email address. And so this package is going to contain the checklist that both the DA and the PM utilize to complete the review. It's gonna contain the DIS and RR forms, the DIS being signed by the PM. And then if there were any disputes um, involved with the invoice, the PM is going to summarize those and include a copy of the email chain in the, in the submission package for approval. The, the disbursement analyst will then 
accept that package and um, prepare the um, RR form and submit that to their manager for approval. And then once the that manager is given approval, the disbursement analyst will email the TA provider informing them that the payment or that the invoice has been approved and that the um, they will be sending the payment um, to the accounting our accounting department. And so from there, we get to the end of our timeline where accounting approves the payment and sends it to the state controller's office and that process taking about four to six weeks. And then I wanna highlight here, if, um, if at any point in the process, um, you suspect that the invoice has been, like you, you need to know a status of it, just uh, work with your technical assistance PM and they will do their best to get you an update on where the invoice is at in the review process. Uh, it might be more difficult if the invoice is on the later stages with the state controller's office, but we can do our best to estimate a time frame by which you might see the, the check in the mail. And then finally, I, I wanted to end off with some um, best practices when submitting invoice packages. Um, so first, just check that the valid signature types are used on all the invoice forms. And if you need a reminder of what those are, you can um, reference back to this PowerPoint slide and it will have the different um, signature types that are accepted for some of our different invoice forms. Uh, second, verify that um, the deductions that you, that were up, that on past invoices are recorded and then updated for your next submission. So oftentimes uh, we'll make a deduction on an invoice, but then the next invoice after that comes in and that deduction wasn't applied to the previous expenditures. So just make sure that as you receive um, invoice approval notifications, note down if there's been any deductions and make sure those apply to the next invoice. Uh, third, verify that the personnel amount claimed on the DIS matches the amount claimed on the labor certification, which we went over. And then fourth, uh, double check any travel um, that it meets CaliJAR guidelines. And so this last one especially is just helpful um, to, to just verify that the correct mileage rate was used, the correct number of miles was claimed. That, that'll help speed up the invoice process um, greatly. And thank you everyone for um, sitting through all of the information about invoices. I know there was a lot of forms and uh, requirements covered. But if you have any questions about the invoicing process, please uh, raise your hand or put them into the chat for us to answer. Beatrice, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, Jason. I have a question in regards of in submitting invoices. Could you clarify if we can submit invoices while we're going through an amendment process? Basically, we're extending contracts. Are we able to submit invoices during that period? Um, it depends on whether or not your current agreement has expired or not. So if, if you're amending ahead of the work completion date, then um, depending on how close it gets, then the answer is yes. So for example, if it's a few months away and the, the invoice process is gonna be complete, then yes. However, if your current agreement has expired, then you're going to need to complete the agreement amendment first and then submit your invoice claim after. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions for Jason? Hi, Jason. Sorry, I can't raise my hand. Uh, wrong Zoom platform. I had a question about the mileage. So you're saying if we use the Google platform and we type in the justification for why we're claiming 183 miles and the map said 179, that would be allowed from the state. So if we went to where destination and let's say we had to do medium household income surveys and we were driving around that community, you're saying that we don't need a map for let's say the 10 miles we drove around that particular community um, for it as long as we wrote it here for that specific purpose? 
Yes. So um, if if you do provide a map for where you drove in the community, that's great. However, like let's say that you're leaving from DFA headquarters in this image and your community is in the Bay Area. So if you just provided the map shown here, and then if the extra mileage was like six or seven miles and you included justification with that, um, it's subject to whoever's reviewing your invoice, whatever project manager is reviewing. But in most cases, I think that would be sufficient. Um, and then we have question? a question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Michaela. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if you saw the question in the chat. Go ahead. So it says you noted a difference earlier between a TA provider versus a subcontractor invoice procedure for the mileage. Are there other other differences in requirements between the two types of invoices? Um, I'm gonna. I'm just giving it a thought. Um. Um, not, not for the travel, no, um, that I can think of. If anyone else wants to chime in with other differences they might be thinking of, go ahead. Um, but I will, I will highlight um, on the travel portion, I was talking about um, a TA provider versus a subcontractor for what we're looking at with travel backup documentation. In, in both cases, the TA provider and the subcontractor need to keep all of their backup documentation on file in the event of an audit. Um, we're just not requesting the full maps from the TA subcontractors or from the subcontractors on the agreement. And then just to just to make sure that we're on the same page, I'm going to skip forward here too. So when I was discussing ineligible costs, we have the um, TA agreement salary and fringe reimbursement type versus the standard hourly rate type. So to answer the second part of your question where you asked about if there's differences between the two types of agreements, um, there are versus when you're when you're considering if it's a nonprofit TA provider using salary and fringe or versus a standard hourly rate type agreement. Um, some of those differences being um, the one I highlighted here versus how um, consultant indirect costs, overhead, or markup fees are considered. And then others um, are going to depend on the agreement itself. And I know that we're still developing some of the agreements that are using standard hourly rates. So as um, if you have further questions as we go along about those types of agreements, then um, any of the TA staff can help you answer those as well. Any other questions for Jason before we take our break? All right, if there's not any other questions at this time, we'll be taking a 10 minute break and we'll resume our training at 3.06. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.
Hello, everyone. Hope you had a good break. Um, since it has been 10 minutes, we will continue with our training. And for this part of the training, I will hand it over to Ibiang to go over fast. Good afternoon. My name is Ibiang Rivera, and I work in the Small Communities TA Unit. I also serve as one of several financial assistance application submittal tool administrators. And uh, today I'll give a quick overview about FAST, how the TA program uses FAST, address some common issues that have come up, provide some resources uh, for FAST, and give a live demonstration. So the financial assistance application submittal tool, FAST, is a web-based interface. Um, it's used by the Division of Financial Assistance to administer grant and loan programs, um, in particular for the purposes of the TA providers. The majority of you will be, if you're working on a full planning project, you will start and submit a application in FAST that's separate and apart, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, FAST is available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, a user account is required to access FAST. And um, so the TA program uses FAST as a portal to collect information. Um, and TA providers will use FAST in two different ways. One, you're going to... Um, we use it as an agreement application portal. So that means um, in the past, we had a solicitation in 2016 that allowed the TA providers to apply and then they were selected and then they used that application as their agreement application, which means they would upload deliverables, project reports and invoices. Um, it's the same pin for the entire agreement. For the new TA providers, um, we are in the process of creating those application or the agreement applications for you. And we'll um, reach out to you separately to get that set up. Um, and then the second way is applying for grant and loan funding on behalf of systems. So that's the clean water SRF and drinking water SRF planning or construction applications. And that will have a unique uh, proposal identification number or PIN for each application. So um, before I continue, so there, there are distinctions. There's a, a clean water planning application. There's a clean water SRF construction application. There's a drinking water SRF planning application. There's a drinking water SRF construction application. So, um, knowing which one of those you're going to be applying for on behalf of a system or whether the assigned work would be uploaded as a deliverable, um, that distinction is made in what we refer to as an AR assignment email. That email um, will let you know whether you're doing a full planning application, I mean, a full planning project, or if you're preparing and submitting a planning application and whether it's clean water or drinking water. So you're always going to want to refer back to that um, AR assignment email. Okay. So um, who has access to the agreement application? Um, when we set up those applications for you, the TA director, project director is going to be automatically associated. Um, and then any additional staff um, that that needs access because they've been designated the person to upload deliverables or progress reports or invoices, um, they can be added to that agreement application at the request of the uh, TA project manager. So who has access to funding applications um, in FAST? So typically that would be the person automatically the person who started that application. It could be a TA staff person. It could be, I mean, TA provider staff. It could be the water, water system or sewer system, or even a consultant for one of the water systems. Uh, additional 
staff can be added. Let's say a TA provider um, staff has started the application, but the system wants system representative wants to take a look at the application. They need a fast um, user account, and we can get them associated with the application. And we'll talk about that in a few slides um, in a little bit. Okay, oops, I skipped. All right, so there's um, a couple of issues that have come up repeatedly in FAST, um, and there's five of them. The first being adding and removing user access to an application, and that could be the agreement application um, as well. So um, there's a tab in FAST that's uh, titled Add User. You can, as long as you know their username, and it is case sensitive, you can add them or you can de-associate that user from the application. So that's for the agreement application or an application that you're submitting um, for funding for a water system or a system. Um, or the second option is you can send an email to the FAST Help Desk with the following information, the proposal identification number, the name of the staff person, and whether you want to add them or remove them. The second issue that has come up is correcting, correcting an applicant organization. Um, typically this occurs when, at the time of setting up the, app, the starting a new application. For some reason or another, the person clicks the wrong button and they, let's say it's RCAC and they have listed RCAC as the applicant. They need to change that. So the way to do that would be to send an email to the FAST help desk with the applicant organization name, their legal name, right? Their legal entity name and their address and the proposal identification number. And then we can um, correct it behind the scenes. So it's an easy fix. Um, so you don't need to panic, but you just contact the FAST help desk and we could take care of that for you. The third um, issue that comes up often is who is the SRF project manager for this clean water SRF or drinking water SRF planning or construction application. And the good news is we can tell you if they have been assigned, we can look that up in FAST. So you can, one, check with your T, uh, TA project manager, or you can contact the FAST help desk and we can look it up for you. Typically it takes like five weeks from the time when you submit an application for that um for a project to be assigned an SRF project number and a project um, manager. Okay, so the fourth common issue is deleting an attachment. Let's say you've uploaded the wrong deliverable, um, or the wrong version, et cetera, to your, app, your agreement application or even to one of the funding applications. So the, you are not able to delete an attachment after the application has been submitted in FAST. However, um, you can contact the FAST help desk with the proposal identification number, the title name, the attachment title name, upload date and time, and CC your um, TA project manager. And then we'll take a look and see if it's something that we can do. We try to discourage people from deleting things because FAST is like a snapshot in time but we understand that occasionally um, stuff happens and you do need to remove something, wrong project, wrong document, that sort of thing. Um, so contact the help desk if you need to have something removed. The fifth um, common issue is correcting a selected funding program for an application. So um, we do not have an easy fix, let's say, you started an application, it was supposed to be a construction application. You started a planning application by mistake for drinking water. You contact the FAST help desk and you say, hey, can you change the funding program? No, we cannot, unfortunately. But what we can tell you to do is to start a new application and you know submit it. The, here's the thing, in FAST, when you start a new application, and I'll show you in a little bit, um, you are able to, um, there's a screen pops up where it shows you which funding program you have selected. And if you pick the wrong one, you can go back 
and correct and fix, you could go back and select the appropriate funding program. So it's just another double check. And how do you know which funding program you should be selecting um, for the application? Again, you're going to refer back to your AR assignment email. So you know which, whether you're doing drinking water, clean water, planning, or construction. Um, that information is contained there. Okay, oops. Uh-oh. Sorry. All right. Here we go. Resources. So there are several resources on the FAST website. Um, we have, of course, the FAST Help Desk. We're available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our email is fast underscore admin at waterboards.ca.gov. Our phone number is 1-866-434-1083. Um, if you call and I'm available, I will answer the call. If I'm not, we ask that you leave a voicemail message, leave your name and phone number twice. So if I don't catch it on the first time, I catch it on the second time. And a user manual. So we have a user manual um, in FAST that you can refer to. It's geared towards um, applicants, you know, the people who are applying. Um, and then the third, we have a how-to videos. Um, several, um, they're geared towards those who are applying for clean water SRF or drinking water SRF um, application. And um, it shows you how to create an account, how to start submit an application, all that good stuff. So um, let's do a demonstration of FAST. Oops. All right. Can you see my screen? Oh, we're still seeing the PowerPoint. Hmm. Now, can you see my um, browser window? Yes, we can see okay. it now. Thank you. All hmm. right, so this is the FAST website and I don't think it's showing very well. All right, here we go. So just to give you a quick orientation, the FAQs, how-to videos, user manual, um, even links to funding programs um, that are available in FAST. You can go here, look it up. Um, so we're going to create an account. And the username is case sensitive. So here's your reminder. Okay, so let's create an account. And FAST is a two-step process. Let me increase this just a little so you can see it better. Okay. So FAST is a two-step process, well, actually three, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's say um, you are creating an account for yourself. You work for RCAC. We're going to try a rural assistance. It's not listed as rural assistance, okay? We're going to try RCAC, and it's here. And you have two options. So if you work out of the free board drive, um, office, you're going to select that one. And then if it's not the correct one, you can create a new organization and you would enter the, the legal entity name for the organization, provide the address. And if you have a DUNS or the unique um, entity number, you could enter that. So um, for the purpose of today, I'm going to enter um, one that I created myself. Okay, so that's step one. This is step two. You're going to enter your information. Oops. First name, last name. Enter if you can. We like to have um, phone numbers, so that way we can reach out to you if we need to by phone. Um, I'm going to enter my email address. And as a means to avoid having a lot of bounce backs, we ask you to do it twice, all right? And you have the option of subscribing to email alerts. However, um, when we say email alerts, that means you're subscribing to receive emails about every funding opportunity made available in FAST. And that could potentially be funding programs like grants. It could be um, loan programs. It could be some that have a set deadline, some that have 
uh, are continuously accepting applications, and it could potentially be a funding program offered by another state agency. So if you don't want to receive all those emails, you would select no. You do leave it as yes. Let's type in a new um, a new user account. Let's see if this works. And we're going to type in a password. And your password needs to have an upper and lower case and at least one new numeric number and a special character. All right, so I have my password in there. I've selected my what my security question is going to be. And you'll need that, the answer, the question and the answer for if you need to um, retrieve your password. Okay. Oh, I didn't like that. Let's see. Okay. All right. So now um, it says to log, go back to the, to the login page. But as you can see up here, it says new accounts must be activated before a user can log on to FAST. So please check the email sent at the time of account creation for the activation link. So you create an account, go back to your email, get that confirmation email, and there's going to be a link. You're going to um, click on that. It's going to take you to a screen that says activation successful. Now you can log into FAST. So I'm going to log into FAST as an applicant or we say applicant, but it's really anybody who's submitting an application on behalf or of their organization or another organization. Okay. I'm going to select applicant. In your case, it would just be applicant and the name of your organization. All right. So this is the applicant main menu. You can start a new application. You can check existing applications that haven't been submitted. You can also look at submitted application. And submitted applications are read-only, so you only get to see things. You don't get to modify any information. So once an application is submitted in FAST, it is read-only. Um, so I'm going to show you how to start a new application. These are, this is our system disclosure. We ask that you use Microsoft Edge because it's the one browser that we support at the Waterboard. We encourage you to save your work often. Um, the system will time out after 90 minutes. And so if you walk away for a meeting, phone call, take a lunch, and it goes longer, any work that's not saved will be lost and there's no way to recover it. Um, disabled pop-up block, blocking software. So you're gonna check each of these. This is going to appear each time you submit, uh, you start a new application. You click on the continue button. So USTA providers are always going to select option two. Applicant organization is not the same as submitting organization. You're submitting an application on behalf of another organization. So option two. And this is where you are going to specify who your applicant is. Um, you can just type in a simple one word, couple words, and it will give you everything that contains that word. Um, you don't need to really concern yourselves about the organization department or the organization ID. You wouldn't know that off the top of your head, so it's okay to bypass that. Um, I'm going to select Pico. Again, if you don't find the organization here, you're working with a system that's not in FAST already, you can create the record for them. But again, you need their legal entity name and their address um, to create a record. Okay, so I'm going to select City of Pico Rivera. These are all the funding programs currently accepting FAST. Their deadlines um, as I said, it's easy to get confused. There's a clean water SRF construction and implementation application, clean water state revolving planning, drinking water state revolving construction, drinking water state revolving planning. So for our purposes, I'm gonna pick drinking water state revolving planning. And this is the screen that I talked about where it's like gives you an opportunity to double check what you selected. In FAST, 
We refer to funding programs as RFPs, requests for proposals. So um, just, you know, when you see this, think of funding program title. And so again, you're going to be referring to your AR assignment email to confirm that you have the correct, um, you're applying for the correct funding. All right. So, and again, this is a description. So you should know that you're selecting the correct one. We're going to say, okay, you can go back and check. Um, like if you were supposed to be applying for construction, you could click back and you are able to select the other funding programs. So I'll just do that. All right, so now it shows drinking water construction. You're great. Your applicant organization is the city of Pico Rivera. You are, you know, your, it'll be your TA provider name. Continue to application. And this is the page where you'll enter basic information, the project title, project description. If you're working with a drinking water system, you're going to enter their um, water system ID, the numbers, not CA. You're just the numbers for their ID, you're going to specify the district office. There's 24. You can enter the latitude and longitude. If you know, um, if you enter the latitude and longitude, the watershed will populate and the county and the responsible water board. So once you've entered that information, you can move forward. Uh, I didn't like that. Okay. So it's reminding you that you need to specify some information. Let's see if it's going to let me. Ah, see. Okay. Well, I don't know these up by heart, so let's see if this works. Uh-oh, we're in problems. Okay. Well, oops, let's see. Nope, it doesn't like it. All right, we're just picking randoms. Okay, there we go. I seven digits. Sorry, guys. Okay. Finally, it likes it. All right, let's go to the next screen. And, and again, this is um, drinking water and clean water SRF applications, whether it's planning or construction, it's very simple and fast. The bulk of the work that you're going to do in terms of the application is all attachments. So in fast, you have that general information tab, real simple, right? Basic information. You're going to click, make sure this is clicked. It should be defaulted already because there's only one program, the bulk of the work is in the attachments. And so these are all the attachments that comprise a, um, an application. So um, I won't get into any of those, but it's simple. You select the title, it populates it here. You browse your computer, you can upload a document and it attaches it and it will list it out here. And this is the attachment title and the date and time that I talk about. If you're requesting to have something deleted, this is where you would get that information. All right. So a lot of you have asked or wondered, how do you add another user to, um, to, to your application? You have the application open. That fourth tab is add user. You're going to add, and I don't know if this account exists. Oh, maybe I could just use a new one. Let's try Oh, maybe not because it's not activated. Oh, it is. Okay, there it is. So I'm able to add them. But again, the username is case sensitive. So if I had tried to type in, let's try it. Um, let's do, well, let's try that. It didn't like it. So it's telling you to go back and double check. So that's how you can add, delete people. Um, you do not need anybody's password, just their username to access, um, to add them, okay? So then that's, and you can deassociate, no big deal. So that takes care of that. I think that's everything that I had that I wanted to show you in FAST. Are there any questions? No questions? Erica, go ahead and unmute yourself.
Well, let me just stop sharing. Go ahead, Erica, with your question. Can you hear me now? Yes, now okay. we can. All right. Um, I had a question about uh, TA requests uh, that change from deliverables to a full application. Mm -hmm. Would I need to contact the FAST admin account to get those deliverables transferred to a new full application submission? So there's no easy easy way to do that, but I would say yes. Contact the FAST help desk and we can um, sort that out. But typically we can copy attachments, but it's not easy. And so um, when that happens, we typically encourage you to, to manually upload those again. All so. right. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Again, for those new TA providers, we will be reaching out to you today, Monday, to get you set up. Um, if you haven't already created your account, um, please do that and send me an email. Um, I've reached out, I think, several weeks ago. So if you have um, any questions about those instructions, just reach out to me and I'll help you. Go ahead, Jennifer. You can um, unmute yourself. Thank you, and and I apologize. I have a question regarding eligible or ineligible costs. Is it too late to ask a question about that? Absolutely not. Okay, Jason. perfect. Thank you. So we have um, a subcontractor. By the way, I'm with RCAC. We have a subcontractor that adds what they call a... Um, what is it called? Um, unit multiplier expenses uh, to the hours charged for each of their staff members on their invoice. So say um, Thomas charged 16 hours and he charged it at X rate and we're fine with that. But then for those same hours, say it was 20 hours, they apply this multiplier and each of their staff members has a different multiplier rate. And so say in this is, is at $6. So they take the 20 hours he worked, they multiply it by $6 and they're adding that to our invoice for what, what they call just expenses. Is that an eligible cost? Uh, hi Jennifer, this is Jason. Um, so the the short answer is it can be, um, but to elaborate, um, we've seen other um, consultants kind of charge for supplies in this way. So the the full answer is it, it depends on what their what their unit cost is for. So and then typically we'd like to see not for every invoice, but at least like one memo or like written justification explaining what the cost is for. So. Um, I'm just giving an example of what we've had some consultants do in the past, but previously um, they've applied, like like you said, that unit rate to their hourly rate, and they've explained that this this cost covers the cost of supplies um, and communications. So that might be like phone like phone lines, and it might be um, like office supplies and other items like that that are directly related to the project, and rather than charging for those supplies directly, they've they've kind of come up with this um, system to, to charge for those supplies per hour. So we, we've approved those in the past, but um, we I can't give you a blanket yes, but it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but um, it's something that we can take a look at. And then um, and then with, with a, like a written justification, give approval for. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. I appreciate it. No problem. Any other questions for Jason or I? And again, if you run into a unique situation with VAST that we didn't cover, 
you're always welcome to contact the FAST help desk. If you contact me directly, please CC the help desk so that way if I'm out, they also have an opportunity to respond. Our help desk is staffed Monday through Friday, eight to five. Yeah, there's no other questions for Ibn or Jason. Um, thank you both Ibn and Jason for all the information you provided at this training. And yes, just a reminder that this is this training was recorded and it will be uploaded to our website. And we will also send out an email with the PDF version of the presentation and also an evaluation form as well as it being put in the chat. Um, and also for those interested, we will have another training next month going over the DWSR construction application. Um, but yeah, other than that, that concludes our training today. Thank you all for coming and I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you.